and um, we've got a little bit of footage to talk to as well. So we mentioned before, Jairus Chanchima uh, from Kenya, 207.43, outstanding PB. Uh, we really were watching with interest. 59.43 is a PB for a half as well, a couple of years ago in Lille. So he will be, well, he's wearing the number one bib. Um, he could be the main man. Rightly so, yes, and Gurme Gebru, the Ethiopian, you know, really fast PB again, uh, two eight. So, so really quality athletes and Ethiopians. Probably, whilst we focus a lot on the Kenyans, the actually Ethiopians have a really good record in the marathon. They're probably almost, you know, at the, the elite end. Probably, um, maybe even. I've got a better record than the than the Kenyan. So, uh, look, he, he'd be very competitive. Yeah, they outshone the Kenyans at the uh, London Olympics and the distance races. This man I just love. We're going to talk about <laughs> him a bit today. Yuki Kawauchi. He's called the Citizens Runner from Japan. Um, he's extraordinary because his race schedule, we'll talk about it a bit later, he's run six marathons this year. He ran an ultra marathon, 50 kilometres, only about four weeks ago. Um, he was uh, fourth here last year. Um, and, um, you know, we were watching with a great deal of interest. I think we've got a little bit of footage of him when he um, uh, won, uh, ran and won the Seoul Marathon earlier this year. Uh, that was a PB of 208.14. He's run two PBs this year, two sub 210s. He is just a gutsy runner who will give absolutely everything. He runs to exhaustion. <laughs> There's proof of that. So uh, expect to see an absolutely honest run from him today. So he won Seoul earlier this year. And another Kenyan, Samson Barmau, who's also got a sub-210 uh, best time just last year in Rome. So in good shape and another Kenyan. And that's what we're going to be seeing up the front of the race. And uh, yeah, I'm not sure but about his um, ability to win the race, but he'll certainly be very competitive. This was in uh, uh, Rome when he finished uh, second in uh, 2012 to uh, uh, another Kenyan. So uh, Samson Barmau, uh, he's from, uh, uh, from Kenya. He's age 31, a little bit uh, older amongst the, um, uh, the Kenyan runners. Um, and uh, someone with a little bit more youth on his side, as we say, last year finished second, Robert Mwangi um, from, uh, from Kenya. We will watch him with interest. Uh, tall runner. Um, really tall. Most really of these tall. other guys, like Edwin Career, um, they're your typically compact ones, aren't they, Steve? They are, and it tends to be more efficient if you're uh, probably a bit slighter. You carry the, the weight across the ground, and tall and range you can, can mean you get a bit fatigued. You've got big muscles to cool. So, And Japanese runner, Tago Ito, another of the Jap Japanese run very well here. So, uh, I'm, yeah, it'll be a bit of a match race. Who, you know, Ethiopian, Kenyan. Japanese, historically very good on the Gold Coast. So, gee, I, I, think, I think they'll run pretty well here today. Yeah, so we've got uh, three or four excellent, well-credentialed Japanese runners. Kensuke Takahashi, um, his PB 211.25. A couple of years ago, um, uh, he won Kobe Marathon last year. Uh, his goal at Gold Coast, uh, tried to make my best run here and uh, get confidence for uh, next Kobe Marathon in November. So he might be a little bit off the pace. I don't know whether we're going to see him uh, beyond the 30 kilometre mark, but uh, you never know. Yeah, I think probably just a um, little bit off it. But uh, and Wanjuku, another Kenyan debuting here. Might help out a bit with the pace, but we'll see how he goes. Never know, but gee, could be anything. Kenyans debuting, that doesn't mean anything, and they still run pretty well. Well and truly, particularly when you look at uh, half marathon PBs, uh, uh, you know, one hour, 32 seconds, um, uh, another well-credentialed uh, runner, but we think he's, uh, he'll be doing the pacing. A very young fellow, uh, Elijah Tirop. So um, we've got two or three paces here. Uh, Edwin Career. Uh, Jacob Wanjuki and Elijah Serum. So, uh, look, they're paid as, uh, as pace runners or they're brought out here as pace runners. Um, so, collaboratively, um, they'll share the lead, um, sharing the work, taking the lead group through to 30K. And um, now we have uh, uh, Jessica Mears back out on the course. That wasn't Michael Milton I referred to before, but Jess is out there with uh, uh, two very interesting stories. Uh, uh, Kate Hollywood, Olympian and hockey roo, and Michael Mil Milton, Paralympian cyclist and skier. Let's have a listen, Jess. I have with me here something of a remarkable human. Michael Milton is a six-time Paralympian, five times at the Winter Olympics and six, uh, sorry, one at the summer. Um, Michael holds the record for the fastest downhill skiing time at 213 
k's an hour, 213 kilometres an hour. So that's the fastest time for a person with a disability and fastest person of any Australian in the world. <laughs> any Australian anywhere. No, it's, early in the morning, isn't it? <laughs> it's really early in the morning. Now, Michael, you've just done some amazing feats in your time and really this, you've, you're coming up and you're about to do a marathon. Now, what came over you that you went, right, the marathon, you know, that's for me. I'm going to try that next. Oh, running's, running for me is fun. It's something I've always enjoyed, I guess, uh, towards the end of my skiing career. Um, my knee wasn't really up to it, but uh, since I quit skiing, it's come good again, so I can run again. And, uh, you know, running uh, up a distance and to a marathon length was uh, a challenge, and that excites me. Um, until yesterday at lunchtime, I thought it was fun, but then Deke said marathons are not fun, so um, maybe I'll go out there today and find a reason why to do it while I'm out there. <laughs> now, you actually have a really interesting way that you have to run the marathon and you have some really special crutches, custom made carbon fibre crutches I believe. Can you give us a bit of a rundown how these things work? I guess um, they were originally developed uh, about 18 months ago by me for World Triathlon Championships last year and uh, they are uh, a custom carbon pair of running crutches with prosthetic running feet on the bottom as springs. So uh, it's an adaptation of prosthetic technology. They're, um, they're the only pair around in the world um, that I'm aware of. And uh, you know, they're, they're just, in the end, they're beautiful to run with. You, you, sp you have spring in your arms and you feel floaty and fast and easy. And uh, yeah, they're, uh, they're nice to run with. So uh, I'm not quite sure I'll feel floaty and fast towards the end of the race today, but we'll see. Now, how did you approach training for something like the marathon? Because as, as your debut marathon, it's something kind of new. Um, and training with the crutches like that, what, what sort of technique things uh, do you have to really be aware of? I guess for me, it's uh, the technique side of things. I've been running a long time. I use crutches on a daily basis. So uh, a lot of that stuff is, is there. There's uh, When we started running with the new crutches about um, 12 months ago, uh, there are a few adaptations in technique and stuff that we worked on and there's some different stuff there, but nothing too specific. Um, I guess from a training point of view, for me, uh, it, it's always a balance. Running with crutches is intense. Your arms are not really built for running like your legs are. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's a balance of, of trying, to, uh, trying to do some long bike rides and some things like that to uh, really get the volume in and uh, shorter runs and, and preparation runs. So, uh, you know, that opens you up for going into to new ground, as you do whenever you do your first marathon. But, yeah, also perhaps new ground in terms of how my hands are going to hold up for the, for the full distance with blistering and, and issues and stuff like that. So we'll, we'll have to wait and see. So, now obviously you never do things quite by halves. <laughs> Doing the marathon wasn't enough in itself. You're actually going to attempt the Guinness World Record time uh, in a, of a marathon on crutches, which I believe is six hours, uh, 6.42. Yeah. So, what, what sort of time are you actually hoping to do today? I guess, um, you know, when you enter a marathon and you know the cut-off 6.30 and the Guinness World Record for class for your class 6.42, you may as well put the paperwork in. So uh, we've done that. Uh, you know, if, if things go well, I'd like to think we can run 5.30 today. Uh, but, you know, uh, again, when you go into unknown territory, you just have no idea what's going to happen or, or uh, how much it's going to hurt or how slow you'll wind up going. Uh, this is obviously such a, an incredible achievement for, for you and, and, you know, for anyone with a disability. Like, it's such an inspiration for anyone out there, really able-bodied or otherwise, to just go and take life by the horns and, and really go and challenge themselves. If you had any advice for people out there who were sort of wanting to test themselves but really not sure how to go about it, what, what kind of advice would you give to people? I guess, you know, at the moment I'm only talking about doing it. I haven't actually done it yet. And uh, it's one of the, the tough things when you, when you come out in the media and say, you're going to do this, then uh, it puts a lot of pressure on you to back it up. So my first piece of advice was don't talk about it. Go do it in secret and then, uh, and then rock up and do it. I guess, you know, in the end it's about uh, life is about doing things you enjoy and that are fun. And, uh, you know, call me sick, call me sadistic, call me whatever. But, uh, yeah, for me running with marathon seemed like a fun idea. So uh, find something that's fun and, and go and do it. And one last one, what's next for Michael Milton? Uh, um, well, next is a marathon right now. Yeah, <laughs> let's not think past this. Let's not get too complex here. <laughs> Just get this one in the bag and then we'll see. Absolutely. It's been an absolute pleasure, Michael, and best of luck out there today. I have no doubt that that record is not long for this world. <laughs>
Thanks very much, Jess. Yes, the inspiration of Michael Milton. Um, some extraordinary people out there. Um, somebody else who's caught my eye who's doing something uh, pretty inspirational, a fellow from Mackay called Mark McFadson, who's actually contesting every event here at the Gold Coast over the two days. Um, so he's, he ran the 5 and 10 kilometres yesterday. He's got a challenge today. He's out there running right now, running the half marathon. Um, he's going to finish the half marathon and then back up and start the marathon. Uh, quite extraordinary. Um, so he's got to finish the half in 90 minutes and then he's aiming for a five-hour marathon, which uh, he's planning to run with his wife, Linda, uh, who it sounds like she's a terrific story too. One of these people, she was 100 kilogram. 100 kilograms uh, four years ago and uh, she's progressed to run the marathon so Mark McFadson we'll try and keep an eye out for him so he's running 78 kilometers 78.3 kilometers in two days so one of the many inspirational uh, runners out there pretty handy runner with his PB too three hours four minutes so we'll keep an eye out on Mark now look just to have a look at the women's elite field uh, Steve Monaghetti has left us for the moment He's out on the course, so let's take you through the women's elite field. We've spoken a little bit about this lady, uh, Yukiko Akaba, third in London this year in 2.24.42. So uh, she is absolutely a world-class athlete. Um, she's run 68.11 for the half. Um, so uh, she's also a, a very high-profile athlete in, um, in uh, Japan. She is sponsored by ASIC, so I think we might even have a little bit of uh, promotional video of her. So she's someone who is uh, top tier uh, Japanese, um, an inspiration to her country people. Um, talking to uh, a couple of the Japanese uh, uh, journalists who are out here, um, they're a bit worried about the depth in uh, Japanese women's running, um, but certainly Yukiko um, uh, Akaba is uh, somebody who uh, could well be bringing glory to Japanese runners um, today. Somebody else who we will have a very close eye on, uh, Eri Okobo. Uh, she's age 30. Again, world-class time, run in Tokyo last year, 2.26.08, uh, a half marathon PB of uh, 1 hour 11.22, also run in Japan. Uh, world-class athlete, so we'll watch her with interest. Uh, the 2011 winner uh, from Ethiopia, uh, back in the mix, uh, Goiti Tom Tasima, age 25. Uh, her winning time in 2011 was actually the second fastest ever here at the Gold Coast, 2.30.08, but she has a PB um, run earlier that year in 2.26.21. So, um, same bracket as uh, the two Japanese and um, someone we will watch with great interest. So uh, we presume we're going to see the, uh, a couple of Japanese runners, a couple of the um, uh, Africans running together. Uh, but we've got a European or two who could be of interest. Um, Alice uh, Garici uh, from Kenya. We spoke about her a little bit earlier. Again, a world-class time of 2.26.36. Alice Garici uh, from Kenya. So uh, we'll watch her with interest. 69.10 is her half marathon PB. Uh, very experienced runner, 36 uh, years of age, which is getting towards, um, uh, I guess, the shelf life of a world-class marathon runner. But she's got a great attitude. Um, she's not thinking too much about her rivals. Um, she's merely trying to think about her own race on the day. And uh, today is the day that counts for her. Uh, Typically not a strong representation from uh, Europe here at Gold Coast Marathon, but a lady who we will have a very keen interest on from uh, Russia, Alevtina Ivanova, uh, uh, PB, 2.26.38. Also run in Japan where a lot of uh, fast times are run on fast courses. They tend to be cooler marathons run in um, uh, that part of the world. Uh, half marathon PB of 70.43, so we'll watch Alevtina even over with interest. We would expect her to be up there with the lead pack, uh, and perhaps that lead pack would stay together for the first uh, 20 to 25 kilometres. Um, a couple of other good um, Africans and Japanese, uh, Helen Mugo from Kenya, age 27, probably in the prime of her career. She's got a PB of 2.27.16, run in Italy in 2010. Uh, she's also well credentialed, having run uh, Rome Marathon earlier this year, 2.32.12, finished sixth there, Helen Mugo. So she will be one to watch. Um, and uh, the last two uh, elite runners who we uh, expect will figure in the mix, uh, Yui Oichi. 
from Japan. She's age 25. Um, PB 239.06 from, uh, she ran that in uh, Japan 2011. Um, winner of Kobe Marathon, uh, 239.52 in 2012. Her goal at the Gold Coast Airport Marathon this year, she says, I would like to enjoy running in Gold Coast because this is my first time racing in Australia. She's aiming for uh, two hours 35. So we'll watch her with interest. Sally Gibbs, quite an extraordinary runner for her age, age 50. And Sally has run a PB of 2 hours 41.15 here at Gold Coast last year. So that's pretty uh, amazing for Sally. Strong contingent of um, elite runners from um, uh, Australia and New Zealand. Uh, we'll show you a bit of a list of those runners later. But Sally, look, she probably won't be in the lead pack. Um, but uh, the uh, Oceania title is up for grabs and she will feature very strongly in that. So we'll watch uh, Sally Gibbs. Um, I've got a bit of uh, female company in the studio here, which Hi. is nice to have. Jessica, welcome. welcome. And Kate Hollywood, welcome. Thank so you. you're excited because uh, you're facing a whole new challenge out there today. Sure am. I'm, I'm not sure about excited. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nervous? No, I have to be excited. That nervous Tell excitement, us that feeling yes. that you're experiencing. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to just starting. I feel like uh, I haven't run for ages, which, um, you know, I'm just looking forward to getting out there and just having an enjoyable run. So, yeah, it's that nervous excitement, which is always good. Now, you're a hockey player originally, so what? why the transition to, to marathon running? Um, well, I've started a little bit of a list of just some things I want to do, so um, why not tick off a marathon? Um, I've done a bit of triathlon in the last uh, few months just for, um, just for a bit of different sort of training. So a marathon, I thought, you know what, I probably won't be able to run one when I'm <laughs> in five years. My hockey body <laughs> won't let me do that, I'm sure. So as long as I finish today, that's all I'm going for. So what's realistic for you today, Kate? Is it just to finish? Is there a goal you've got in your mind that I'd be delighted with this if I ran. Yeah, it would. Look, I, I don't want to be competitive because I just want to finish. But then, hang I'd on, hope an Olympian not yeah. being competitive. <laughs> I, I don't believe. think that fits in the same sentence. But does then, it? I would like to finish under four hours ten because I heard that's average and I'd like to be better than average because I am competitive. <laughs> but in saying that, I do just want to cross the finish line. So if I'm crawling, I, I will cross the finish line. And how long has the, the training been for you for, for today? Uh, well, I signed up, I think, four weeks ago. So <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> let's just say I'm not too prepared. But um, I got told that if you run 30K, you should be able to run 42. But then I've also been told that about 32, 35 is when it really starts to hurt. So... Uh, yeah, I'll just be waiting to experience that today. Well, no doubt you've got plenty of advice from people out there. The best advice I could give is is just whatever time you think you need to run through the half marathon, add a couple of minutes <laughs> yeah. to that. So go out slower. You can always yeah. come home quicker. But, yeah, you really find out who you are and what real pain is like at 32 mm -hmm. kilometres. But But this will be a life experience, won't um, it, for you, yeah, Kate? Yeah, for sure. And that's why I wanted to do it. I did the half up here last year and I was so inspired by the people coming through um, – you know, every type of athlete, you know, there was just normal people, elite runners, and just to do something like that, it is inspiring and, um, yeah, and a fun event. So why not tick it off the list? Absolutely. Any other challenges uh, beyond the bucket list of a marathon? But uh, uh, I would like to do Ironman, so... <laughs> I wow. know, I think I've turned crazy, but... Um, <laughs> I've, I know a few people who have competed in some and I think, you know, I'd love to do that sort of training and um, there's the variety in the training with the three legs and I think, you know, maybe I could have a train train for that, do something different, so I don't know. Get, this, knows, get yeah. this one in the bag yeah. and that's one leg done. Exactly, sort of, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so yeah, we see it. that with elite athletes, there's, there's quite a few and, and obviously it's difficult I in a post-elite career, having been an Olympian, that you're used to setting a challenge. What's the next goal? What's the next challenge? In hockey, it was what's the next international tournament. So is this sort of part of that transition for you? Yeah, for sure. I think like you're, you're very used to that. I mean, it's been my whole life hockey and um, that's it. I'm always preparing for a tournament. And I guess I love training and I love fitness and exercise and that healthy lifestyle. So I train all the time. I thought, thought I'd like to do something. I need that competitive side. I need to get that out of my system. So that's why I guess I've started to sign up. And it's nice to have a, a goal as you said a small goal you know a little thing just to just to compete in when I did the triathlons it was just to enter a race and compete and get that out of my system not that a, a marathon's a small <laughs> thing by any means <laughs> no no <laughs> Kate what's been your support network you've obviously trained with some people and, and that makes a bit of a difference I'm guessing um yeah I do a lot of the training by myself I just like running okay. um I haven't joined a running club or anything I um I just run when I feel like it so yeah. um yeah I guess I've just been 
doing, I haven't done too much training obviously in the four weeks, but um, I've tried to just do a little bit of the, the long runs and yeah. I've obviously got a lot of, I've got a lot of friends who are into the mm. um, Ironman and they've done a lot of marathons. So I've got a lot of tips off everyone and um, which hopefully will help today. So uh, tips and ticker <laughs> as in showing heart, yeah. that uh, the two things yeah. you might have to rely on I today. Think mentally, I think I've got that in me, but you know, I'd, let's just hope my body does as well. Just now, make sure that support squad are all sort of positioned in the last 10K. Yeah. Just space them out. One well, every I actually 10K don't know anyone up here, so that's <laughs> not going to help. So well, anyone who's out there who's a random, please yell out and say something. <laughs> but Kate, that will happen. Yeah. Uh, you will make new friends yeah. out there. You'll mm. find uh, tough parts of the race. And Jess, you can attest to this because that was your marathon experience. Uh, you made yes. some new friends out there who I helped did. get you through. It's really remarkable. I, I competed in the marathon here at the Gold Coast oh. in 2010. Um, and just same as you, I wanted to yeah. finish the race, wanted to sort of try and get it under the four hour, four ten mark. And um, yeah, ended up running half the half the whole race really with a complete stranger called yep. Terry, who oh. was a great guy and just the same kind of pace runner yep. really. And um, you know, you meet some amazing people out mm. there. So yeah, it's really a wonderful, wonderful event and have lots of fun out yeah. there. So Thank Kate, uh, we, we know it's, you're smiling now. We know you're not going to be smiling <laughs> in about three and a half hours, but uh, good on you for, for having a go, for yeah, taking yourself you. out of your comfort zone. So um, we will say enjoy it or enjoy the experience, savour the experience. You'll never forget it. No, I don't think I will. No, definitely <laughs> not. But I, I am looking forward to that experience and I know I feel good at the end of it regardless of... I know I, I won't feel good, but I know in myself it was a good thing to do. Yeah, great. Look, we look forward list. to catching yeah. up afterwards. Okay, thank you very much for joining us, Kate Hollywood and uh, Jess Mears. Uh, we'll see you out there again. Uh, we're going to cross back out to the course. Uh, we've got Steve Monaghetti out there with uh, a marathon legend, Australian runner, Lisa Ondecki. We are down here in great atmosphere down here on the start line. Lisa, exciting, nervous people behind us. Well, I've watched thousands of people come into the start. We've got thousands behind us already. We're within 20 minutes of the start. I'm seeing some smiles, some relaxed faces, but I'm seeing a bit of tension and some really serious runners, I think, who are out here to run personal best today. And what are they, what are they feeling right now? What's that? What can they do? There's no, no, nothing really more they can do in their preparation. So what should they be doing right now? I think just thinking about what they're going to do at the start of the race, one of the biggest mistakes you can make is to go out too fast because it's slightly downhill here at the fast and there's just so much excitement, so much atmosphere. If you go out too fast, you'll pay for it at the end. So they want to be thinking about their pace judgment. And the women's section most particularly, they don't want to get caught up in the men too much, but they'll be right up the front as well in the women's. They will be, and they know how to do it. It's great for the women, especially the lead women, to have men to run with. It helps them along the way to pace their run. But you've kind of got to watch and guard your own space a bit at the beginning, just so that someone doesn't clip you on the heels and trip you up. Right. We see Deke dispensing some advice beside us. Lots of people out here excited, I'm sure, about being able to maybe run their first marathon, but some would be experienced, would have run a few marathons before. Maybe, you know, you try and have a bit of a chat early on. Yeah, and um, make friends along the way. Sometimes it gets a bit lonely in the middle, and if you find you're running alongside someone, you can have a bit of a chat. We don't usually see too much talking in the last 10K, though. Everyone's saving everything for the, for the finish line at that point. And we often think that the pace will be a bit slower early, but you're really running the same pace the whole way, so you're trying to get, it, get into that rhythm really early. Yeah, well, the, the most efficient way to run a, a fast marathon is to run basically dead even pace the whole way, which is a very difficult thing to do, but that is considered the most efficient way to get your best time. And I think the weather's pretty good. No wind, great temperature. We're looking forward to a really great race today. Good luck, everyone. Good luck to everyone. Thank you. Thanks very much, Steve and Lisa. Uh, the atmosphere is building to the start of the marathon. Uh, the half marathon, uh, men's, has been run and won by Martin Dent. Terrific win by Marty Dent. 63.49, just pipped Shinichi Yamashita from Japan. 63.51, Ben Moreau, 63.53. Uh, we might have a bit of a replay of that later, but we're seeing some fantastic aerials here, Jess, of, um, of the race precinct of the start. And we've got a bit of a, a, a postcard perfect day out there. Not too hot. Conditions yeah. good. Oh.
running out there today. Um, it might get a little bit warm yep. as the day goes on for the marathon, but yeah, you really couldn't ask for better conditions. It's always mixed feelings with the uh, the weather that we get here as, as a tourism postcard. We love to see the blue skies, which we traditionally get. I th can only remember one wet uh, uh, half marathon uh, marathon over the last uh, 10 or 12 years, but we are seeing some wonderful footage there of the uh, postcard uh, Gold Coast area. Um, but in terms of the, the, the weather and the temperature, a very light breeze out there, I understand. I think it's currently about 14 degrees. Um, it's tipped to get to a top of 21, but if it stays below that 18, 19 degrees um, during the, uh, the the men's and the women's uh, marathon, that's probably pretty good temperatures. Oh, look, I agree with you. And, and, and if you're out there competing, then it's a pretty beautiful day to finish up and maybe go for a dip in the ocean afterwards, I'd say. It is, yeah. And with the temperature is not too bad this time of year. I went for a dip after my 10k uh, yesterday, so it was fantastic. We're uh, about to see the start of the uh, the wheelchair marathon, so um, we've got uh, a fairly small field in the uh, in the women's and men's uh, wheelchair marathon. These guys, typically the men, go through in about uh, one hour 30. Uh, the women are usually around the 145, 150 mark. Quite extraordinary what they really can do. Really amazing stuff. The technology, so this is carbon fibre, it's all streamlined stuff we see in the wheelies. Uh, they're amazing what they do. They move so fast out there. It's really something remarkable to see. Um, incredible athletes, these guys. And of course, all, all the upper body strength that they have, when you, when you look at a, uh, a, a wheelie marathon, uh, um, everything from the hands to the forearms to the biceps and the shoulders, uh, it's quite extraordinary to see the, uh, the upper uh, body bulk for those guys. So we're uh, about t 10 minutes away from the start of the of the uh, men's and women's marathon here at the Gold Coast, the 35th Gold Coast Airport Marathon. Um, uh, Australian running legend and Australian all-comers record holder Robert De Costella always has words of inspiration for the uh, men and women out there. And uh, Deke, as usual, is out there to inspire them with some words. He's inspired millions of marathon runners around the world to do what you're about to do. Okay. <laughs> he so inspired what, okay, one tell runner us. last year, Almei Emiu, the Ethiopian who won this race. He died in January. You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. There is only the now. Make it worthwhile and make it special. And we'll see you at the finish line. Who won them? Bob De Costello. Uh, he's fantastic, isn't he, Jess? <laughs> Deke. He gives this inspirational uh, speech every year and uh, invokes the spirit of Pheidippides 2,000 years ago, but it's yes. inspired people since then. Oh, look, he did the same bit in uh, 2010 when I ran mine, and it really set the scene for when you're starting out there and you've worked so hard. Um, you know, most of the people competing out there, whether you're elite or you're just an everyday runner, um, you've trained for, for months before this event. So it really is such a wonderful thing to have, have Deke out there and really really building the atmosphere and motivating everyone. And you set off with, it's, it's actually quite hard to contain <laughs> yourself. You've got to really slow yourself down and make sure you don't go out too hard. That is the trouble because you've been holding back. Uh, you've, you've tapered, you've carbo-loaded. You're feeling really good at the start of, uh, of the marathon. And uh, I know it's a mistake that beginners make and even some experienced mm -hmm. athletes uh, can still go out too hard, which is why I've seen a Kate before, add a couple of minutes to whatever you thought you wanted to go out just hold yourself back because you can always pick up time later mm. but mm. it's really hard if you've gone too hard because that last 15k is just a world It'll of pain. It'll get you for sure. Now I know you've run a couple yourself. Yeah marathons. so I, I very proudly remember running on debut 226 here at Gold Coast and I mean that was quite experience. I'd run 65 here at the Gold Coast, finished second to Malcolm Norwood in 1988. I remember saying uh, to uh, a documentary crew at the time, the wall, the wall doesn't exist for elite athletes. If you've done the training, you know, you know what time to run, uh, you'll be fine. But I smashed into the wall at, at 30 kilometres and uh, I really struggled. So uh, I was a pretty experienced runner then. So mm. it happens to all of us. Yeah. So the advice... We, you probably can't hear us out there, guys, but uh, uh, our advice for anyone who's watching the webcast or thinking they might like to run 
marathon down the track. Mm. Just go easy. There'll be a, a mixture of emotions out there now. Um, it's really quite extraordinary, isn't it? You're, you're nervous, even if you've run them before. Uh, you know you're going to be in pain, and there's a few doubts about how you're going to handle that pain. Yeah, well, I mean, it is such... Uh, I mean, the, the vast distance it is, it's so uncertain. Um, you know, it doesn't matter how well prepared you are, there's always going to be that little question in the back of your mind about, oh, this time around, or even if I've done a few, how am I going to go today, and am I, am I going to really get through? And, and if you're pushing yourself and you're setting yourself a time, mm -hmm. uh, it can be really quite challenging mentally. And I know for me, when I finished... When I finished the race, for me, I just wanted to cross the line and, and do a decent time. But um, it was quite an emotional thing, crossing the finish line. And um, it's quite hard to explain. You couldn't really explain why I was sort of almost crying when I was yeah. across the finish line. But it was just, you know, such an amazing feeling to have finished something like that. We see that quite regularly at the end of the marathon. <laughs> uh, emotion abounds, so whether that's relief, tears, joy. Um, but it is an achievement. So for all those uh, marathoners lining up, five and a half thousand of them today, um, um, including the uh, the wheelchair marathoners, the men and women who are about to take off, um, they are to be admired. Uh, we feel like there's a there's a brotherhood and a sisterhood with marathon um, uh, runners and um, uh, you know wheelchair marathoners as well because everyone goes through a similar sort of um, you've got to dig deep, mm. you're well and truly out of your comfort zone, and um, it's fantastic to achieve it. It's really that mental aspect isn't it it is it is um of course uh you know the the, uh, the accessories you have these days with things like fuel belts where you can actually carry your drinks uh, gel, uh gels and goos and all these carbohydrate um, uh, packed little sachets uh, they're usually used by most athletes these days because uh, as we talk about the wall that area of the marathon um, somewhere around 30 to 32 kilometers where um, all your carbo loading um, you've you've spent up your fuel um, <laughs> so it's uh, well and truly advisable to uh, carry goos and gels as will the uh, wheelchair athletes uh, they probably don't go quite um, uh, deep into the uh, the same uh, distance uh, same time out on the road as other athletes but uh, certainly they'll be expending their energy around that uh, 30 32 kilometers so we're getting ready for the start of the uh, uh, the first marathon for the day there off they go Jess the uh, the wheelchair marathoners um, and these are elite athletes uh, and and you know it's great to see that they have pushed themselves yeah, absolutely. And for, for anyone out there who isn't aware, I mean, do these guys do the same, exactly the same course as the running It is, yes, yes. So that's why they get the head start. Uh, some of them will be overtaken, but the, uh, the elite people um, will come in well and truly ahead of the, the marathoners. So, so for them, um, uh, there's a couple of little rises, um, uh, particularly going over the first bridge. Uh, which they're going to find a little bit challenging. But um, certainly uh, that downhill ride is fantastic for them. Got I always envy them when you see them doing that. Into neutral and uh, cruise down the other side, it'd be nice, wouldn't it? Well and truly. So we're only about four minutes away from the start of the 2013 Gold Coast Airport Marathon. Um, five and a half thousand runners out there. Um, the uh, half marathon has been won. Uh, the men's result, Marty Dent as I say, from the ACT, 63.56, which is a pretty slick time. That's about two and a half minutes off the race record. But uh, I wasn't sure that Marty was was going to get through, but that's great to see, isn't it, Jess? Yeah, it's a wonderful time. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a great crowd out there today, and the, the field was really hot, and he's come through with the performance on the day. He's going to be happy with that. We'll see if we can find a replay of that a little bit later, but obviously a really tight finish with uh, Yamashita from Japan mm -hmm. and uh, Ben Moreau from New South Wales. Uh, a really close finish. Uh, ben just two seconds behind uh, Yamashita, who finished second. Um, lots of atmosphere building out there. Uh, we've got the Australian Girls Choir who are going to be singing the national anthem so we'll be looking to cross out to them just in a couple of minutes in fact we'll cross out to them now
So the Australian Girls Choir, um, the National Anthem, which is uh, pretty traditional at sporting events these days and lovely to see. That might inspire a few people. Uh, Steve Monaghetti is back in the uh, studio with me. Um, Steve, you get any sense of the atmosphere out there? A lot of nerves, a lot of people excited? Yeah, a lot of a lot of agitation. You know, they're always worried, oh, where am I on the start line? Am I in the right place? Where? So it's all of that uncertainty at the start line that um, that normally, that's how it works, I suppose. And you kind of, you know, you're trying to just try and relax as much as you can before the gun goes, but there's a bit of anticipation waiting for the event to start now. There is, and it really is a relief when the gun goes, doesn't it? Because you've just got one thing to think, to think about there, just one foot in front of the other, trying to settle into a pace. Uh, so we've got 5,500 runners out there who will uh, be a mixture of emotions. Uh, the sun is up. Uh, we think it's somewhere around uh, 14, 15 degrees. Uh, conditions feel OK out there? It, it felt really good, to be honest, and that's what I'm conscious of, the wind. But the temperature will always, you know, rise, obviously, through the race. But the wind, if the wind doesn't get up, I think it's a south-southwesterly, which is perfect for this race. So... Good conditions. No excuses, I don't think. Will, will we put a pressure on early? We'll call it early. <laughs> oh, look, for those people who haven't followed our uh, ramblings over the years, um, we've been talking up the, the race record. It was broken two years ago, but we didn't quite slip under two hours ten. And for those who don't follow marathons closely, it really is quite a, uh, a, a barrier and a mark of success for uh, an international marathon, having a, a two and a, a single digit in front of that rather than two ten. That's right, yeah. When we're so close, 210.01, it'd be great to get under. Can't get any closer than that. Uh, so we have a quality field here today with uh, some very good African runners, uh, some fantastic Japanese runners. Um, so don't expect to see the Australian and uh, New Zealand runners um, in the lead. And here we go. We are off at the start of the 2013 Gold Coast Airport Marathon, the 35th Marathon. And uh, people are having to shuffle through the start there, Steve, because uh, it gets a little bit congested. But um, your, your chip, of course, only goes off once you pass the start line. So it really doesn't matter how long it takes you to get across there. Just a matter of finding an early rhythm, which we will see with the, uh, the Kenyan runners in the yellow singlet out there. Already no surprises there. You get the African and, and Japanese contingent to the fore. They like to get, they do like to break early. I, I must admit that's one thing that really has surprised me. They won't sit in the pack. They, they just run as a group. They'll really establish that lead group and get very comfortable having the runners around them that they're familiar with and expected to take some of the pace and just settle into that pace really quickly early on. You're already seeing, look at that, you know, you've got, what have we got, about 10 runners there who have already established a clear break on the rest of the field. So uh, these elite runners will be running uh, sort of around the three minutes to 3.05 per kilometre. Um, uh, we will be watching very closely for the first five kilometre split. We'd expect that to, well, if we're looking for a race record, we need that to be around 15.10 to 15.20, don't we, Steve? Yeah, so I think I worked out it's the, the, the record pace here is about 3.05. So, you know, you're working on for 5K, you're at 15.25. But they want to be a little bit ahead of that. You were right earlier, and you exactly predicted... I I reckon there's a, a, a two-minute differential between the first half and the second half. That's normally what I tell my athletes. So they would need to be a little bit under that time. So if they're around that 15 minutes, they'd want to be, I reckon, having not spoken to the pace, but if I'm if I'm up there and leading, I'd be saying close close to, the, to just over 15 minutes would be perfect pacing early. So um, uh, we'll keep you abreast of who these runners are, but we can see a couple of the pace runners there. Edwin Career, number six from uh, Kenya. So he, he is one of the pacers. So for those um, who aren't familiar with the way international marathons are run these days, uh, it is very standard to uh, bring out a couple of uh, world-class athletes. Don't uh, think these guys are any mugs at all. Um, and, uh, you know, their job is to not necessarily finish the whole race, but to... Uh, sort of uh, buffet the lead pack from any uh, win for, to set the pace. Um, Steve, it, it really is established to have paces these days, but does it lose some of the purity in races being and world records being run these ways? Well, if they run fast, that's kind of the way it is. And it, it, is, it is really difficult. What can happen? Wouldn't it be a tragedy today if we had perfect conditions, but a couple of the lead runners thought it's all about winning and they got a bit tactical and they started slowing down, trying to get a person to go around... No hesitation in that happening. And what it will do, it also establishes that pace early. To be honest, 
You know, sometimes you get so caught up in the race that you're not sure about what pace you're running. Whereas they don't need to worry about that here. These runners know that the paces are going to run that pace. They're probably talking, you know, 302, 303 uh, minutes per kilometre. Yep. So they'll know that they don't, it's taken care of. So it's one variable that they don't need to worry about. So I think it's pretty established. And also the other thing, surprisingly, if it's windy, which we don't think it is today, they can block that wind for you, which can be a real advantage. So we're looking at a lead pack of about uh, 12 runners there, so uh, heavily dominated by the Africans, as is um, uh, most races around the world these days. Uh, the depth in uh, uh, Kenyan and Ethiopian running is quite extraordinary. So we are seeing the paces there. So that's Edwin Career from uh, Kenya uh, wearing number six. Um, Jacob Wanjuki, 27 from Kenya as well, um, uh, wearing bib number nine, and Elijah Tirop. He, he's a young fella. There's, he's only age 20, so um, although he has already run a marathon. Um, for these guys, uh, the elite runners these days, Steve, they almost don't need a watch. I mean, I know we use technology, but uh, particularly the experienced runners, they can just feel them themselves almost, you know, what's 3.05 compared to 3.10? Yeah, you normally get a bit of a sense. And it can be a quite a, a skilled art. I, I actually paced a race once. Not that it's about me, but I did pace a race once after I'd retired. And I remember it was a Japanese race. And, um, and it, it's not really all that, um, you don't talk about too much in Japan. But they said, look, we've got a plenty of room to move. You know, we want you to run 302 per kilometre, but you can feel free, you can run 301 or 303. I looked at it and thought, you're joking. <laughs> My gosh, I don't know if I can hit it that accurately. Gave you, accurate gave you two oh. seconds of wriggle room. That's yep, what it was that about. Was it. That was it. So it was very generous of them. So I was under pressure. Gosh. Yeah, and, and, and that's the thing for, for these guys. It, it really is about um, trying to hit those times early. Um, we will watch the uh, the splits with interest. Uh, we think if they're going through the halfway mark, um, which is uh, as they're, they've turned north back from Burley Heads, um, if they're coming back through there around 64, um, is there any danger if they've run sub-64, Steve? Dare we think that they run as quick as that and they're a little bit ahead of the pace? That mm. that might be too quick. Yeah, it's a, one of those strange things you kind of happy because you're going wow that's a bit of you know room to move I've got a couple of minutes up my sleeve but then you're suddenly also thinking wow it's close to my could be a half marathon personal best so they're going to go oh gosh I'm running too fast here so it's a bit of it's a bit of a, a bonus but also a bit of a, a noose around your neck wondering if it's too fast and that you're going to pay for it later which normally normally works out the one thing to, to realize is whilst they look like they're just jogging they are running the pace that they will run the whole way. So they're running 20 kilometres an hour right on. You see them watch it, looking at their watches, checking the pace. They are running fast right now. It just looks easy because yeah. they're, they're so efficient at what they do that it looks like they're just jogging. But they are running already, you know, at a pace that's, uh, you know, world class. So we've got a pack of 12 runners there. Um, uh, we can't make out who they are, but I guarantee that would be the top 10. Um, elite runners, and uh, we might even have another. So, we, uh, the thing we'll, to notice is the difference between maybe an African runner compared to a Japanese. Japanese always a lot more compact, often quite small. Nito on the left of screen there, you can see in the yellow, very compact and very small, and, and just seems to be very efficient. Whereas a lot of the Africans, and even Mwangu, we've mentioned, really tall in the back mm. there on, uh, on the right of screen, and not as relaxed. They tend to, you know, throw around a little bit, but they're they still get the job done. So there's really different styles and it can be tall, short, compact, efficient, pretty loose and, and quite rhythmical. But, you know, there's different shapes and sizes, even in this lead pack at this level. But the Japanese, you would normally notice, they tend to be, and they grimace. I don't know, the Japanese always look like they're doing it. Huh? They'll, they'll either smile or they'll grimace. There's nothing in between with the Japanese. But and sometimes they be mistaken, can't it? Uh, yes. Being a compact runner, uh, the likes of yourself and I, Steve, and the Japanese runners, you know, around 60 to 65 kgs. Any frustration in seeing the taller guys, the Deeks and the Mwangis with the big stride? Do you think, do you wish I was chewing up that much time with that big stride? Oh, not really. And traditionally now we've seen the runners go away to be a lot more compact and efficient because you're light on your feet. You're carrying that weight over such a long distance that to be efficient and light on your feet is a much more efficient way of doing it. And Rob, Rob's probably one of the last of those real power runners, whilst, and he was the greatest marathon runner of the 80s and our, our greatest marathon runner ever. But he was very powerful and strong and he ran with aggression, whereas a lot of the marathon runners now, it's gone through that transition. They run less, looking like they're powerful and, and aggressive. They're a lot more relaxed, trying to just conserve that energy within. 
So you've noticed a difference in the oh, yeah. uh, in, in the the size and the shape of the absolute elite guys. So there was yeah. a, a Bordin in the eighties, yeah. Alberto Salazar, Rob, um, tall guys who who dominated. There were still lots of uh, uh, Africans and uh, Japanese through that era, but. Uh, it just uh, it's kind of evolved the, the the race and the event that the uh, the superior athletes tend to be uh, smaller and more compact. Oh yeah, for sure. And I noticed that I was one of the um, smaller athletes at the start of my career, and by the end of it, I was one of the bigger ones for sure. So it, there's definitely a transition to a smaller, more compact, and lighter rate. You know, subs under 60 kilos now is, is almost just accepted that that would be the weight that you would run as a marathon runner. So uh, we'll be coming up uh, pretty close to uh, 2.7, close to 3K. We'll try and get you some splits uh, fairly soon. Um, but we're uh, looking as the athletes uh, head south, um, probably around the uh, the Broad Beach area. Uh, So we're watching the uh, the lead group. I'm just trying to spot who that uh, on the right there, running next to Mwangi. Is that one of the Japanese uh, runners as well, Steve? Uh, I think so. It looks certainly looks. Um, it's hard to make Japanese, out who yeah. that is there. Well, they've got the cap on backwards and the, and the glasses, <laughs> looking like coming from the nightclub, not in the in the marathon, but maybe worried about the heat. This uh, down through this area, Steve, as we head south, this is quite protected, isn't it? This early it part of the race, yeah. building shade, no wind. Yep. No, really good spot through here and, and quite shaded, which early in the morning you're getting that shade from the tall buildings down towards Main Beach. And good crowds in this part of the course as well. This is where a lot of people will stay because it's so close to the start. So good area for, for getting good support. Excellent. Now, look, we're going to cross out to the course. We mentioned Marty Dent won the uh, men's half marathon before. Jessica Mears is out on the course with the women's winner, Nikki Chapel from Melbourne. I'm here with the winner of the female half marathon and Nikki Chapel taking it out. Um, how'd you go out there? What, what did you feel about your performance today? Um, yeah, I was reasonably happy with the time. Um, I was hoping to get 110 something today and I think I think I was just over that, maybe 111 flat. So it wasn't too bad, but um, yeah, it's a, it's a good indicator of how fit I am for the marathon in four or five weeks time. Okay, so what's the marathon you've got coming up uh, in your sights? Um, the World Championships in Moscow. So it's on August the 10th, I think. <laughs> yeah. So this is a good training run for you. How did you find the conditions out there today? Um, yeah, all well, the conditions are great. There wasn't any wind, it was flat, um, great temperature. So no excuses. It was a bit of an early one for me, not really used to that. So um, yeah, but managed all right. <laughs> And uh, what, are you, what are your thoughts on, um, on the field out there, the competition, um, any rivalry going on out in the field? Oh, well, I'm always, I never expect to win. I mean, Jessica Chengrove is in great condition at the moment, so I was always worried. But, um, yeah, very happy to have a win today. <laughs> Well, best of, um, you know, congratulations for, for the win today. Obviously a really, really excellent achievement. Um, and I know you're about to go for a warm down run and I, I stole you away from that. So I'll let you head off. But um, yeah, really but well done today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Jessica Mears with Nikki Chapel. Uh, 111 out there today, Steve, for uh, Nikki. Uh, that's that's a pretty handy run, a couple of minutes outside of PB, but um, uh, she's got the World Championships running the marathon in Moscow in uh, in August. So she should be pretty happy with that. She'd be delighted with that, yeah. And she, she ran that 68 when she was in fantastic shape and she's had a, a, some injury concerns in between so I reckon that's really good running and the half they run fast up here so 71 minutes for a half you know that's that's good going so that's a terrific result for Nikki. So Marty Dent's time just to, to reflect on that 63 that's a really good win by Marty and that was yeah. a pretty good quality field were you surprised at all that he's come home first? Well a little bit he, he, um, he had a go he had a crack at the Australian 100k record not all that long ago and um, so I thought he might still be a bit fatigued from that but he Marty is a really tough cookie, really tough, and loves his running, and uh, that's a really good result. He ran under 64 minutes, so 63 in the 50. Must have been a great race. I think the three, uh, there's a certainly a close finish, so um, they'd be, um, they must have been racing, sprinting to the finish. And Marty doesn't get beaten all that often on the line, so you know when he's thereabouts near the finish, he's going to kick home pretty well. So uh, we'll have to catch up with Lee Troop um, uh, a little bit later with his time. I haven't got Troopy's time here yet. So no podium finish for Troopy, but um, 
Uh, he's an absolute warrior uh, of uh, Australian road running. So we're looking at the, uh, the elite men's field for the men's marathon, the 35th Gold Coast Airport Marathon. Uh, all that pack is stuck together. We're oh, losing we one already, we which is interesting. One. And I normally look, if they're packed like that, it means they're probably about on pace. Once they start getting into single file, you start worrying then that um, the pace is a bit quick. Gee, I notice um, certainly when you He's really looking at his watch. I, I don't know. I sense they're running pretty fast, to be honest. I just, it, it's early, and I'm not going to, going to make any assumptions, but I, I'm sensing that a couple of guys are actually struggling a little bit at this early stage. So I reckon they're, um, they're running pretty quick. So if, if we've lost a couple, uh, that probably tells us we're certainly uh, under 65 uh, split for the half marathon pace, which would, uh, well, so 2.10.01 is the uh, course record here. Um, uh, the other one which we'd love to uh, see go, and we'll talk to uh, Robert D. Costello about it later, 2.9.18, the Australian all-comers record. And there's, uh, there's a fair bonus uh, pool money for that as well, an extra 20000 Is that much of an extra motivation? Does those thoughts cross your head when you're out there, Steve, the money? Well, I used to think it was motivation until a couple of years ago when, uh, was it uh, Manza, I think, ran the course record around 2.10.01. There was a, I think there was a five or $10,000 bonus to run under 2.10. He didn't seem all that concerned about it. I'm sure his agent would have said, hey, hang on, mate, you, you could have kicked <laughs> home and got under. But... Um, <laughs> You know, I, I, it certainly is, but it's not why you run. Yes. It's a bonus if you get it at the end of the day. Sometimes, you know, they wouldn't even be aware of it until afterwards. Someone would go, oh, look, you realise you did this or you did that, and they, they wouldn't be aware of it until someone tells them after the event. Better to think about it after. Not good to think about it before, and certainly not a, not a great idea to be thinking about it during. Well, it, uh, it's not the sort of thing which is, uh, you know, going to affect your pace at all. You're not suddenly going to be able to, uh, uh, you know, lift your cadence or lift your rate. Um, it's about running a, at a measured pace, running to a race plan. No doubt this group is running to a plan. I guess uh, the likes of uh, uh, Gebru, Chan Chima, who we're seeing out there, Kawauchi, they're probably just trying not to think too much. Just get into that rhythm, let the lead guys do the work. Um, is there a pattern or a process that worked for you in these early stages? Do you not try not to think too much, Steve? That's exactly right. And, you know, you've got good peripheral vision early. I didn't mind taking in a bit of the track. They'd be looking along. I mean, you're running along one of the best coastlines in the world, so you'd be looking out, seeing the way. You know, I don't mind as long as you're not wasting too much energy, but you also need to have a little bit of a distraction just so you're not mentally, because you can only concentrate and really focus for a certain amount of time. You're hoping that you click these kilometres off without too much trouble. You don't get in trouble, so you know, you get to your drinks, you don't step on anybody's toes, you don't um, clip a heel or anything, you just get into a nice rhythm. You might space yourself a little bit. Some people like to sit in different spots in the pack. They're moving to the, the right-hand side of the road, there must be a drink station coming up, so, you know, you want to stay clear of the, the, the messiness of a drink station. Try and get in pretty early. There you go. You see them stopping. Look at that. There's a bit of a mess in there. You mm. want to get in and out of there as quick as you can. <laughs> Avoid all the, all the trouble that happens at a drink station. But you need your fluids. That's how important it is. It's so important that they're going to grab it. And it shows you how quickly they are running when you see them going through a drink station like that. They're almost stopping to grab a drink because they're running so fast. So people think, oh, you just wander over and grab a drink. It's not that easy. So... Um, they'll grab a drink and to hopefully get out of there pretty clear. A bit of drink sharing going on there between a couple of the lead runners. Um, uh, of course, we talk about those electrolyte replacement drinks. Um, that works for uh, most people. Um, interesting um, information about Kawachi, the Japanese runner. Uh, he's got a special drink that he uses. It's made of orange juice honey and lemon juice and it's made by the high school cafeteria nutritionist <laughs> where he works so right. it doesn't have to be Gatorade or um, Endura the uh, sponsor here for Gold Coast Airport Marathon orange juice honey and lemon juice what right. worked for you Steve what well, was your not special that. drink I can tell you it certainly <laughs> wasn't that no it was more the uh, the electrolyte drink so yeah the Endura's Powerade, Gatorade, just trying to get a little bit. Of, it's mainly the water content anyway in it, so with a few electrolytes. But, you know, there's the old rule of if you're thirsty, it's too late, so you want to get it on board early. So I was keen. I carried my drink bottle um, for a little while with me because I like to sip on it and try not to get air in it because if you get air whilst you're drinking, you know, you might upset your stomach a little bit. That, seriously, that 
What's that orange juice? In? That had, that acid in my stomach. I don't know. Gee. Oh, anyway, I, I was I'd doing be burping wrong. if I was drinking yeah. that sort of thing. But That's it's right. uh, it's it's one that works for him. Now we got some splits. This is interesting and this is great to see. 15, 16 through 5k. So averaging 303 a kilometre. Uh, this is race record pace. This is 209 territory. So uh, if we keep this going through to uh, 25, 30k, Steve, uh, we'll have a a red letter day here. We will. They've settled into that pace. They're spot on. Gee, I, I wish Wanjuki just. Stop watching, looking at that watch all the time. He's obviously very conscious of probably not as experienced as a pacer. He's not as comfortable in the pace, so he's looking all the time. And uh, but they're certainly right on pace. So that's established a good rhythm now. You know, you know, no uncertainties. They're on that pace, and they can stick to it. What uh, dictates uh, w whether they stay on pace uh, through to the next 20 or 25 uh, or through to 25 kilometres? Mm -hmm. Because there's no reason these guys can't hold this pace given their PVs. But we sometimes see that they'll, they'll start out at a really good pace um, and then they seem to slip off. Yeah, often it, it'll be a hill or it'll be a, a, the wind on a, on a section of the course or a or turn twisty bit. So it's often hard. It's, it's basically something breaking up your rhythm. So if there's any hills, and, and this course is, is very flat and very fast. So you might go around a couple of roundabouts, maybe over a speed hump. But other than that, it's pretty good out here. So there's no reason why this pace couldn't just continue now. Very flat and fast. So uh, a couple of very small rises over bridges. Uh, that's the only um, um, inclines that break up the course. Hey, terrific news, Steve, as well in the splits for the women. We are on record pace there, 17.31. Uh, we've got a pack of at least four or five. Alice Garici, uh, Goiti Tom Tasima, uh, Helen Mugu, uh, the Japanese Eri Okobo, and Sally Gibbs. So. Uh, can we dare to dream that we get a men's and women's race record today? Well, it, and that'll, it often happens because obviously that means the conditions are good. If you're getting one record, there's no reason why you can't get both. And I'm serious when I say the women's field here is pure quality. So it wouldn't surprise me if, um, if it does happen today. So we're just looking through uh, this uh, lead pack of the men. So there's the splits for the women. Uh, Alice Garici, 17.31. So the women's race record is 2 hours 29.29, set in 1993 by Eriko Asai. So uh, that's due to go. Um, there's uh, quite some, uh, some length and history to the... Uh, yeah, and it is interesting and sort of the African dominance there, not, not as many um, the Japanese, and I thought the Japanese females are very strong. And Sally Gibbs, that's, that's great. Sally's a um, great story. She's, I think she's 50, and uh, she was fourth or fifth here last year and ran a PB. So she's, she's in great shape, and she's in that pack at a very, very fast pace. pace. I'm very surprised that she would be at that level um, in, in this early stage. So she's obviously feeling really good, and it's great to see. Uh, her up there in that event as well. So the women certainly right on pace. Again, they've got that pack established, which I love seeing the splits. You know, you're all close together. So they've obviously got a pack. It's, and the women, they can run off the men. So they've got people around them who sometimes will um, allow them to sit in, get a bit of cover if it is windy, and they get into a pace. A lot of the men actually will run off the women because they know the women run such an even pace. It's terrific that the, the women are, are dead even on pace. So they're great people for the men to follow, believe it or not. Looks good there up the front. We're seeing a bit of indication. I think, um, you know, they're just talking, passing a few signals across to each other. So the men there, are, I think they seem to be pretty much on top. Certainly the paces look pretty good and that pack might have established itself a bit. Now I was a little bit worried, but it seems to have just settled into the pace a bit. So whilst we've lost one or two, I, I think the ones who are there are in for a pretty good day. So the one or two have dropped off. Uh, that's a bad day at the office if you're not uh, holding this pace oh, through yeah. 10K. Something's yeah. gone wrong. Uh, illness, injury, something's flared up early on. Um, something that you uh, may or may not have been aware of. And uh, you don't normally get uh, tested out this early on, but it's a long, long way home if you've uh, fallen off the pace this early, Steve. Yeah, and they may choose not to finish. I don't like... You know, I don't like the, the DNFs beside your name, but in this instance, you know, it, it can be a business. And if they're dropping off and having a bad day, might be an injury, might just not be, not quite be on their game today. They'll probably, they may not finish and they might end up going out to, um, out to another race in a, in a few weeks. So not their day. Well, uh, I don't think your DNF